Liverpool lover boys now under the, the the gaze of and you know and the um, supervision of, of care home workers and nothing at all is done to stop it or even recall it that there, there was no legal obligation for them to actually keep a record of it um, or even debrief the children so uh, as a result of, of my evidence now care homes have an obligation not only to um, make a note of, of what happens to the children they also have to record the ethnicity of the child and the ethnicity of the people picking them up um, and <clears throat> And also, uh, there's an obligation now to debrief the children uh, when they do return and find out exactly what has happened, and you know, and to share that information uh, with, with all concerned agencies. Um, you know, more importantly, the police, as before, it wasn't law to do that. Well, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they, I mean, there is this culture around now, John, that actually there's very little point in w- blowing the whistle because number one, often the press will. Um, and as happened with Savile, you know, you can talk to the press, but then they say, "Oh, sorry, uh, we're not going to broadcast your, what, what, you know, what you've been telling us." Uh, but then also, quite often, there are there's a very bullying culture whereby, as soon as someone begins to even question, uh, then they they can be moved out of the organisation, put in a box marked "troubled" and bullied out. Well, well, I endured a four year campaign, uh, which really resulted in my imprisonment. There were nine offences put against me. So when I made serious allegations of malfeasance and corruption, um, instead of investigating it, it was turned on me. And I endured a horrific campaign um, because, like I said, I was threatened with the loss of my home, job and children. Um, My home nearly went because I couldn't pay my mortgage because my wage was removed. I went nearly three years without any money. Uh, there were nine cases that, that they engineered against me. Every single one was thrown out um, by the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, and there was an attempt to, um, to take one of my children off me. Um, so you suffer massively if you speak out about serious corruptions within government institutions. It's not just within the police. You see it in the NHS. Uh, there's doctors that have come forward um, and been bullied. But we are seeing it now. With, with a very brave MP called Andrew Bridgen um, uh, for Leicestershire North, who's speaking out about deliberate cover-ups with it, within the health service regarding vaccines. And, and, and he is, uh, I'm watching him, and he is enduring a very similar campaign to all those whistleblowers, especially the police whistleblowers, that, that, that I've um, come acquainted with since I spoke out. Well, the reason I, I've got in touch with you, <clears throat> John, is because of this David Carrick story. But before we go on to that... Do you think you could, um, you know, say something about what, how, as someone who's been th- literally through the grinder as a whistleblower yourself, if someone is thinking about blowing the whistle, uh, what would, advice would you have for them? Well, you, you really think seriously. Um, I mean, I, for me, it was a massive moral decision because, uh, you know, as in the, uh, the words of, of, of Edmund Burke, it, you know, in order for the triumph of evil, it takes but for good people to do nothing. Um, the, the, the case that I spoke out about, you know, two of the children involved died. You know, it's serious. You know, it was appalling what was happening. So, for me, it was, it was a moral thing. Um, no one else stood by me. Um, you are going to get hammered massively when you do it. So, be prepared. Because um, what I, I was told by a very, very senior male police officer... Uh, was that if you speak out about this, you will be thrown to the wolves. We have no idea who or what you're up against. No one can help if you speak out. Um, you'll find that senior management, higher ranked officers, whatever institution you are, they will all band together. If a complaint is made, the complaint will go nowhere. If an internal grievance is made, it will get boshed. I was told if I ever made a complaint of bullying, uh, of all that the um, and this was by the senior officer. He said the the forms will be filled out. It will all be endorsed. It will do the round robin. All parties concerned will be spoken to, and it will land back on my desk. And he said it will be filed over there. And he pointed to the waste paper bin. He said I will never betray fellow rank. You have nowhere to turn. So this is what you're up against. 
you know, um, uh, an institution should never, ever be allowed to adjudicate itself, which is what the police do, which is what the banking industry do. But we need the more ombudsmen, more independent um, uh, adjudicators for, for, for these things. And it's all right having whistleblowers, Lord, but they need to be enacted. So we can have whatever laws we want. There are laws that say we should not be raping children. But does it stop people raping children? No, it doesn't. Um, what we need is these laws properly policed. And that's why we need a fully functioning, credible, uh, uh, you know, integrity-led police force. OK, so what do you make of this? Um, how on earth was David Carrick um, allowed to be armed? I mean, you do wonder if maybe uh, there is, um, you know, when somebody looks like a bit of a maniac or a psychopath and they're an officer, they might be deliberately put into uh, something like an armed unit because, the, you know, an armed unit is likely to have to deal with some of the very worst, most dangerous, difficult situations. But having someone that is prepared to kill, is prepared to go the extra mile, actually that may be, there may be some merit in that, possibly. Well, well, well I, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. In the army, that might be the case. What we've got to look at, parallels between recent history. So we have Wayne Cousins from the same operational command unit, the same OCU, as as th th this other guy, this David... Um, David Carrick. Well, the interesting David thing is Carrick. his boss is a guy called Neil Basu. We haven't seen him anywhere on the press. That is his actual operational commander. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of Bashi. I think he's a Sikh, isn't he? Or he's a Sri Lankan or something. Um, um, oh, yeah, I do remember him. Um, but, I mean, Wayne Cousins had the nickname of the Rapist. You know, and, and we've got to look at this this uh, command unit that does the diplomatic and parliamentary protection. It, it used to be called the DPG, uh, Diplomatic Protection Group. We used to call it Doorways, Porches and Gates. That was their nickname. It isn't, in my opinion, I'm not denigrating these guys, it isn't policing, in my opinion. It's a world of difference to the policing I did. I was a detective. Um, these guys do two hours on, two hours off. Um, they stand there, you know, okay, they put guns. I don't think there's been a recorded case where they've actually used a bullet. Um, there, there are cases where they've shot themselves. You know, there's been people who have shot themselves in the foot and they've actually committed suicide when they're on weapons. So th these aren't, you know, like, like active SWAT teams or anything like that. The fact that they've got a gun doesn't mean they use it. So the DPG, I don't think they have ever used a gun. I might be wrong, there might be that isolated case they had. But in recent history, no, they haven't. They're just standing embassy doorways. Um, I'm not again. I don't want to knock anyone, but doing what I would say is sod all. It isn't really police work. Um, but you know, it, it's a bit like the airport police. With they're all, all armed up to the hill, and when you see these guys, they, they spend a lot of their downtime weight training. It's a very ego-driven sort of thing as well. Um, Wayne Cousins, you looked at him, there's all pictures of him all sort of beefed up in the gym and, and what have you. He was obviously using social media and, and you know, the internet to, to get hold of women and then using his position as a so-called armed officer to enhance his credibility with them, which is what this other guy um, is doing as well. You know, and he, his name was Bastard Dave. So, so this clearly is a guy who's got a reputation for, for not being a nice fella. Um He's a prolific rapist. This man would have some deep-rooted psychological problems, as would have um, Wayne Cousins. Now, the, these deep-rooted problems will hemorrhage. When you're working in the police, you're very close to other people, you work unsociable hours, you know, and, and you're on a ship and so, so you tend not to be able to lie with your personality. So there will be people that, that really had doubts about this guy. You know, he would have made a lot of people uncomfortable. He would have made a lot of comments to women. He would, he's definitely a player. Um, I would have thought his social media, there'd be pictures of him with his shirt off or doing a bit of gym work or something. Very, very much look at me, a narcissistic um, person. If you take him back his timeline, I would say that, that this is a guy with a very low emotional intelligence, um, a very self-driven guy very selfish and probably a very cruel man as well. So there would have been alarm bells. Now, what the police, and I said this before with Wayne Cousins, had they had done basic 
profiling on, on, on Wayne Cousins, he would have pinged up as a very dangerous individual. And I will evidence that by the fact that he had come to the notice on a few occasions for flashing his penis, right, in public. And anyone who knows anything uh, about sex crime profiling uh, that flashes and what we used to term knicker knickers, people still wear underwear, are very um, high charge, dangerous, um, opportunistic, that's the way. So, so in flashing, he will, he will have a need to do it. Right, but he will gauge his victim on their on their reaction, and if they they're horrified, it will it will enhance his arousal, and if no one's about, he will go, not just from exposing himself to rape to murder. And the moment I heard uh, that this this fella had been looked at for indecent exposure, I knew that that guy was capable of rape, based on the fact that, that I work closely with with sex criminal profilers, and I work. I did a lot of investigations in, into child abusers and rapists. So it's something that we know about um, because that's the work I did. Now, these guys who stand there with their guns on that, they don't do any detective work. They don't, as we would say, even nick themselves shaving. I, I would have thought their arrest rate is almost non-existent. And if they do arrest someone, it will be for a very low-level public order crime. It will, there will be no um, investigative um, pedigree with these people whatsoever. Uh, right, so they, they won't get caught up in the same world that I did. Um, and it's the same with, with, with this other fellow that, that's his, uh, David Carrick. He's, um, you know, there would have been alarm bells. Now, what I said when, when I did an interview about Wayne Cousins, if they brought in the most rudimentary of psychometric testing, which involved the propensity to commit sex crimes, they would have been detected very early on. So, for an example, Tony, when I went into work um, in the command unit that I did investigating horrendous sexual crimes um, and, and uh, murders and things like that against children, I had to be psychometrically tested. And then I had to uh, set an interview with, with a psychiatrist. And, and the questions are very cleverly designed to work out if I had any paedophilic tendencies, if I watched pornography, if I had a propensity to hurt myself or, or to self-medicate because I was entering a very, very disturbing world and they needed to know that that, that my reasons for going in there were firstly they were honourable but also once I was there that that the impact of, of the horrific nature of the crime wasn't going to push me down a very dark path and if I had been a victim of childhood sexual trauma working in that environment would have probably killed me off, okay? And, and th these tests are pretty good at identifying that. But it, but it, it goes straight back to, to the base level of, of what crimes um, are graded above the other. Now, for me, no worse crime is that than, than the abuse of children because that damages society in general. When you destroy a child, you destroy their life, you destroy society. Okay, but the police don't put that as priority. So there, there is no need at any point during police training or during the selection process to look at that person's childhood trauma, um, and especially if they've endured sexual trauma. And I would say that, that both um, this David Carrick and Wayne Cousins have, have come from very disturbed backgrounds, which at the very least would have exposed them to abandonment issues. Um, and, um, and maybe issues around their mother, but also they could have been exposed to sexual abuse at some point in, in, in their timeline, and which would, again, um, be, you know, a, a foundation for their offending. And in no way am I saying the victims of abuse going to be sex offenders. I'm not saying that. But it will create a propensity, and, and there is that damage there that if it's not dealt with properly, can go on to become something very, very sinister. OK, well, what about professional standards here? Because we keep hearing about this organisation. There seems to be something going on where genuine whistleblowers were saying X, Y and Z. If they are rocking the boat, they can get targeted and removed from the police, even though they're actually doing their job by reporting an incident. Whereas uh, the, uh, the opposite is true for the psychopaths. Now, 
Uh, how on earth can professional standards um, be made, forced, to make the right decisions in these cases? They seem to be, the whole thing seems to be upside down. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I would say that the worst detectives I ever encountered were from the professional standards unit. They were vexatious, they were politically motivated, and they were at times they were nefariously tasked. So every single one of us... Uh, whistleblowers that, that really come to prominence. Um, so, for example, there's myself, there's Maggie Oliver, there's also Lenny Harper, a very brave man, who um, stood up against the Hotel Grenchel, um cover-ups, you know, where kids were murdered ritualistically and all sorts. Like every single one of us, we were all bullied in the same way by the professional standards unit because they were tasked, whether it's central government, whether it's military intelligence, they, we'll never know, but they were tasked to destroy us, to silence us. And what they do is they, they, they attack us by looking at our data protection, you know, if we violate data protection. What, I mean, I was exposing, um, you know, children as young as nine year, years old uh, being used as prostitutes, in which the police knew about it um, for a good 15 years prior. They, they knew of the sex rings, they knew of all sorts, but they did nothing. So in order to silence me, one of the things the Department of Professional Standards did was they, they, they arrested me for theft of a sheet of A4 paper because I allegedly printed off a, an invoice for a private business, allegedly, on, on, on a work's computer. Um, they couldn't prove it, but they said that even though the, the value of the, of the bit of paper is, is, is almost negligible, it's still theft because you can't put uh, you know, value on theft. So on one hand, I'm giving them um, malfeasance in the public uh, office in which this is deliberately covered up and aggressively covered up. Well, which, by the way, by the way, that particular offence uh, is up to life imprisonment. Yeah, of course. And yet, yet, so they decided to push that to one side and deal with me for theft of a sheet of A4 paper. So the professional standards are, are absolutely monumentally appalling. Um, they are failing massively. We have to also look at the fact that, you know, in, in the early 2000s, the police deliberately, um, you know, bowed down to, to government pressure and lowered the entry standard, which is when the likes of Wayne Cousins and, and this other nutcase got in. Um, so when you lower the standards, well, well, this is what happens, you know, and, and this is it. So. There would have been alarm bells, and I'm going to give you another example of what the professional standards do. So they, they try and wash their hands of any sort of corporate liability. So the commissioner of the police, um, now I would say that this fella Rowley, I, I actually like the guy. He was very, very favourable to me, even though he was an assistant commissioner. He was the one who actually signed off my pension. He's, in my opinion, this, this guy has got heart. Chris Dick, uh, I've got absolutely no confidence in her, in her whatsoever. Um, I think she's an appalling individual. And I did question, you know, um, her integrity at a civil hearing, you know, and accused her of lying. Um, and, and she may have been uh, in position when, when these boys were signed in. I'm not too sure. Um, but, but what I'm saying is, is that, you know, um, it, they don't want to end up being in court. So what they'll do... And here's an example. I always like to back up what I say. A girl came to me, a serving officer in the Metropolitan Police, and she was being sexually assaulted by a sergeant. He was coming into her locker room and grabbing her tits and her ass. right? Very attractive young girl, but it was causing her a huge amount of distress. right? She reported it. It was witnessed. And do you know what the professional standards did? They turned around to the other officers and then they then sanctioned them and threatened them with discipline because they had to be approached by professional standards to give a statement. They, the onus was on them. When they saw this young girl being molested, they should have come forward. So what happened then? Every witness then changed their statements and said that it never happened because they were frightened. So, what you know, this is perverting the course of justice, you know, in its rawest form. And this, this is how the professional standards work. And they put fear into these officers 
And the, the copper's biggest fear is losing their job, losing their pension, going to prison. You know, I could have gone to prison for theft of an A4 bit of paper. You know, so this is what they do. Professional standards put the onus on the poor individual copper, put them in fear of everything, scare the life out of them. Suicides in the police are twice that of any other high risk suicide occupation. You know, and then they can shut the case down and the integrity of the police can carry on. I mean, this is a maniacal way to behave. What do you put it down to? Uh, I don't know. It, it's wrong. It's corrupt. It's distorted. It's twisted. I mean, any um, environment that treats their whistleblowers, like myself and the, the others, the, the exact same way. And we're not just talking about the Met Police. I'm talking about the states of Jersey, Greater Manchester Police. I've heard of it from Northampton Police, but from Divin and Patton, all over, right? It seems to be how they work, and I call it the algorithm of bullying. It's total and utter institutional corruption, you know, um, and yet it's totally washed away, and it's, 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 it's disgusting. And they self-adjudicate. That's the other problem. The police should never be allowed to self-adjudicate. And, of course, you get the IOPC... Uh, they used to be called the IP, I don't know, it's called something else, another acronym, right? Now, they say that they've changed. So it used to be the Independent Police Complaints Authority, I think, the IPCA or whatever, right? Um, they said, no, we've changed now. We're not that anymore because there was too much collusion with the police. They're all, they're all staffed by former officers anyway, okay? So they leave the job and then they go into these civilian postings. But what happened with the, the IOPCA or whatever it was, it then just merged into another acronym doing the exact same job. Not only was it doing the exact same job, it was doing it in the same building with the same phone numbers and the same staff. Um, so even when you're in the police, that they clamp down on you. So you take it out to the, the, the independent adjudicator and it's still full of ex-coppers the same gang. Uh, well, look, what yeah. you're describing here is almost like, I mean, actually, it's a kind of gang culture, really. It's almost like it's a clique, and you're either in or you're out, and if you're out, then you're going down. Oh, it's a mafia. It's a mafia. Now, look, I, there, there's certain things go on in the police um, that I, I happily turned a blind eye to because every job needs its perks, and some things happen, you think, good, that's justice and all that, but I could not turn my eye, a blind eye, to the fact that children were, were being used as prostitutes, as sex slaves, uh, you know, sex exploited. I could not allow it. It was it was wrong. And I expected everyone to be behind me on that. I'm not talking about, you know, a cop who's taking a police car home for the weekend, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the detective taking the car home and things like that, or um, filling up with petrol and putting some in their car, you know, whatever that is. You know, I, I wasn't interested in that. I was talking about serious and organised sexual criminality. And I expected the service to, to assist me. And they didn't. And it's the same with these guys. You know, there would have been alarm bells all along. There would have been alarm bells. And, and what was it, put down to lattice behaviour or you know, him being a player, you know? I mean, I, every single posting I had, there was always a guy that was called the rapist. Always. There was coppers having it off with prisoners, with victims of crime, you know, all sorts. They were, it was always going on. Um, and, you know, none of them ever, ever, to my knowledge, ever got convicted of it. Um, and it would be the same people doing it all the time. Well, I mean, it sounds like the Met is like the biggest gang in London, isn't it? Well, I don't know yet. And, I, you know, I've come up against it. And, um, you know, coming back to your earlier question, would you ever recommend anyone to stand up against them? No, I wouldn't. Not unless you're prepared to lose everything, and that includes your liberty and maybe even your life. Um, no way, no way. But if you've got integrity, um, you should... Well, should you really consider being staying in the place? Well, exactly. I mean, how can you live with, with yourself if you don't? But what about the roles of the, you know, the senior people where we're talking here about the Met Commissioner and the Home Secretary? I mean, obviously, Pretty Patel should 
uh, and Cressida Dick have known about this. I mean, it does, you know, maybe right. something positive for Rowley is that he's bitten the bullet on this one and he's also yeah. prepared to answer questions to the press about it all, unlike Neil Basu, who's the head of that command. Yeah, yeah. and um, of course. And, uh, you know, I, I have confidence in Mark Rowley, I do. Cressida Dick, none whatsoever. I mean, she even denied being in a meeting when I, I you, know, I don't, you know, it was meant to be a one-to-one -one meeting with her. Um, I was with a colleague and I told her exactly what was happening with these children. And then she went on to deny it. Yet I produced, you know, evidence, uh, you know, with, with her endorsing it um, on emails that I was in this meeting and these things were discussed. So, you know, they will lie. They will, will um, cover up for each other. And like this guy said to me, you know, again, he went on to become one of the UK's most senior police officers. And he said, if you ever expect myself and others to, to betray rank, you're mistaken. It isn't going to happen. So they are not going to go against rank. It's not going to happen. <coughs> Why, I don't know. I mean, even to the point when when they are summoned on a parliamentary level to uh, to account for their actions, um, you know, they, they don't play ball. In, in respect to my case, the, the Cabinet Minister for Policing and Crime summons Cressida Dick to account for herself in Parliament, and she just simply didn't bother turning up. Um, you know, and, and the City of London police aren't even accountable to Parliament or the Crown. So, you know, that's another world in its own right. Um, but th they will they will clamp down. And the one thing you are guaranteed that officers will do when they're in trouble, and I'm telling you now, they will lie. Right, the first lesson you're taught when you're a police officer is how to give a, a false, false evidence. You know, bear false witness. That's the first thing you're taught. And if you're not prepared to do it, um, you you ain't going to be trusted at all. Um, and that's definitely within the CID. It might have changed, but it looks like um, standards have got worse. They haven't got any better. Um, but you know, they they are quite happy in lying. They're quite happy holding a Bible in their hand and lying. They're quite happy looking a judge in the eyes and lying. So don't think because they, you know, they're holding a Bible, they, they've got a uniform or they've got a warrant card, they're going to tell the truth. No, they're not. And that's not just a place of social services will do it. The medical industry will do it. They will all lie to protect ultimately themselves, but also their colleagues. Um, so God bless anyone who stands up against that culture. Well, that's amazing. Um, so, so what do you make of Suella Braverman? Does the Home Secretary really have that much power? Maybe she's been involved in this outing, this um, guy. Well, I mean, you, you know, the, the, the Home Secretary, they've all got answers to the Home Secretary, ultimately. But um, what, what's the Home Secretary going to say? You know, didn't they say the same thing about Wayne Cousins? And when was that? A year and a half ago? He was sentenced a year ago? I mean, they said exactly the same thing. And then in the same OQ command, almost the same modus operandi, we get this other maggot doing the same thing. I mean, they're a carbon copy. And what has changed? And, I mean, what Rowley's saying is there will be vetting. Well, it should have been done in the first place. Hmm. There should have been vetting. There should have been psychometric testing to identify this level of deviance. It wouldn't be difficult to do. Um, they can task any sort of... Um, trick cyclist to, to put a, a package together you know and psychometrically evaluate these people properly and get them out but no they decided to, you know, look the public gets what the public wants you know no one kicked off when the police lowered their standards um and of course these are people that are going to police you and what they're going to do you know they're, they're going to fail you so you must have standards i mean when you get like the military you know, you, you get you get these elite units. They don't. They never drop their standards because they have to. They realise if they drop their standards, there's a problem. Yet the police are doing it all the time, and and they think there's not going to be a problem. Well, uh, I remember reading this book, Untouchables, a few years ago. It was yeah. for a while. It was very difficult to get hold of. Michael Gillard and Laurie Flynn. Yeah, yeah. About yeah. I mean, what they were describing there in, was in great detail. Well. well the book, well, the book was very difficult to get hold of, but it was describing a criminal fraternity in London that was indistinguishable from the police. Well, 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 Tony, that book, The Untouchables, there's about five people in there. I work with them. 
there's one guy who's, who's one of the worst characters in that book. He, he was my DI. He was my detective inspector. You know, and and he, I saw him once. Um, you know, attack attack the detective sergeant in front of everyone. You know, um, you know, I, I work with these guys. You know, in my early detective career, I knew a lot of them that were in there. You know, it was unbelievable what some of them were doing. And if you went against them, one one guy, <coughs> one one guy who's mentioned in that book, right? Um, again, I'm not going to mention him because he he was never ever investigated for for what happened. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to kill him. But he he's he's one of the main characters in that book, um, Untouchables. And uh, there was a case of of uh, protection racket going on, and someone had screwed up. Uh, the detective sergeant had screwed up and we was um, out um, having a, an office lunch and what happened was this sergeant come in to, to, to this restaurant and this inspector stood up, went up to him, um, took him outside and smashed him in the head so hard uh, the guy's bone um, went from his cheek and went and uh, pierced his eye and he collapsed on the floor and this inspector went leaving there, leave the dog on the street where he belongs. And they had to pension this guy off because of his injury. And nothing was ever said. Nothing was ever said. You know? I've, oh, mate, I've seen some awful, awful things gone on. Usually involving brutality. There was a lot of rumours of, of money going missing during searches. Um, guys involved with, with very well-known criminals. Um, they want to live this gangster lifestyle, but they're not like the gangsters. You know, a lot of these gangsters were brought up in the care homes. They went to the approved schools. They went through that awful apprenticeship of, of bullying and buggery and beatings that moulded them in, into these uh, very, very damaged, very highly organised um, criminals. Um, and then you've got these coppers then have come from different backgrounds and decided and thought that they were they were they were like them and then they started really um aligning themselves with them doing the co cocaine was a huge problem in the cid it was a monumental problem you know and one guy uh, had a locker next to me he used to go and do a line of charlie before going up to, to the cid office you know and they and some were have, having sex with prostitutes and then linking in with gangsters and going to parties and all sorts so yeah you know and, and of course, you speak out, and some and and they, don't get wrong, you know, coppers. Some of them back then were tough guys as well, you know. They were tough guys. They were fighting men, and um, and you, you know, firstly you, you'll get a kick in, and secondly you'll get stitched up, you know. I think m so, many of the public they don't realise that there is this contingent out there. I actually went to college with a guy who was a flasher, a porn addict, and uh, after we left college, I, I heard from a friend of a friend he'd gone into the customs service for obvious reasons. You know, he was you know he was able then to use his job to get hold of pornography, and I, I just wonder if there's any way that we can stop um, really sick individuals of various sorts targeting these professions because we rely on these professions in a civilized country uh, for our uh, criminal justice system, for our law enforcement, for our whole civilization, really. Yeah, I worked with one guy, and he insisted on going to every single autopsy that involved a young woman, and in the end, the coroner threw him out. Threw him out. Of, of the autopsy and just said, you know, I, I don't want you in there again, you know, um, and I was present when he did it. Um, and he said he's always turns up every single autopsy involving the young woman. He's not even his case. He turns up, you know, sick. I mean, I mean, autopsies are appalling. And, and this autopsy was um, of, of a very young girl. And, and this guy insisted on turning up. I refused to go in. I didn't want to see it. And, um, there was no need for me to, to see it. The continuity had already been gleaned. It didn't need a uh, bolstering. Um, but yeah, there, I, what I said to you at the very beginning, put in rudimentary psychometric testing and that, that will identify these sexual deviants. It will do. We had to do it when, when we worked with the child abuse units. I never come across any rumours of any detective on the child abuse unit that was a wrong one. I didn't. Um, but I did come across um, 
officers outside of that that, that were wrong ones, that were, were, were sexual deviants, paedophiles and perverts, many, 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 you know. Um, but within that, uh, because we we were um, psychiatrically evaluated um, and it was a continual ongoing thing. Uh, so that's all they've they got to do. They, they've got the skills to do it. There is a know-how to do it. And the same with vetting. You know, this, this David Carrick, it, it, you know, there have been allegations and allegations of him, you know, um, being involved um you know, uh, in perverse practices. With, yeah, but with anybody women. can make an allegation, can't they? You know, and also it does look as if many of these allegations are against decent police who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, it's, I mean, the whole system seems to be broken. Uh, is there? Is it fixable? Well, well, you know, if we look at this, right, um, only 2%, this was years ago, 2% of child abuse allegations resulted in, in convictions, 2%. That didn't mean that 98% of those um, accused of it, you know, were innocent. In the eyes of the law, yeah, but, you know, and it doesn't mean that 98% of the victims who didn't get justice are liars either. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, everything can be fixed, you know? You can turn anything round. I mean, uh, one, one, one of the safest countries in the world now is Rwanda. You know, years ago, if you'd have said that the, the Rwandan police and the, and the military uh, are going to be like a bastion of, of, of professionalism. But you, people have laughed at you, but they they are en route to becoming that. It's becoming a very very safe place to be. El Salvador did the same. They 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 stripped their police to the bones and they got them properly trained, properly looked after. And this is what you've got to do. You 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 you've got to treat your staff properly, but also you know like I said, do the vetting. Do the vetting properly. When one of the units I, I worked on, I had to deal with top secret information. So I had to do a very deep level vetting. And they needed to know all my sexual partners. They needed to know every single bit of debt I'd ever been in, everything. It was really scrutinized. And, and I had to go to a meeting um, uh, with, with the vetting department. And they explained that this process is incredibly intrusive. and. Um, and you know, and it, and it can be very painful for people. And the, the the woman sergeant, she said to me, she said, "I'm going to tell you now that um, a lot of uh, homosexual officers fail vetting." I went, "Really?" She said, "And it, it's been gone through the civil courts and everything else, and it's been deemed that it is not a homophobic thing. What it means is that, that a lot of homosexuals tend to have uh, more promiscuity." They're, they're, they're straight people, okay? And it's just something that, that is the case. Not on every single incident, but on the whole, it's the case. Which means that if you, you've got a prolific sort of sexual um, life, you know, a promiscuous sexual life, you're going to be more open uh, to corruption and, and to blackmail. All right? So this deep level vetting, it roots it out. So you're not going to be put in a compromised situation. You know, but how many MPs have we seen that have been compromised because of, of, of their, their sexual preferences? You know, we have seen time and time and time again, you know, and especially when, when you know, the investigation in the Operation Conifer that was going into Ted Heath, who was a prime minister, you know, and we've had numerous other MPs that have come to light, and, and we've just seen it with Lord Janna, you know, the Ipswich Inquiry have just released their findings yeah, on Jana. I mean, Cyril, Smith, Cyril Smith was one of the most prolific. Cyril Smith, there was allegations against Leon Britton. And, you know, Leon Britton was a Home Secretary and a Foreign Secretary, and there was many allegations made against him. So how are they allowed? They're not vetted to that degree. Yeah, how are they allowed in their positions? So if you did that vetting, that level of vetting, you know, I found a way of streamlining it, Basic searches on social media would have exposed this guy. If they was to search dating websites, it would have exposed all of these people. You know? Amazing. And, I mean, also, one of the aspects of the, with Wayne Cousins and David Carrick is they would have been stood there with a gun, supposedly protecting the Queen or, or King Charles. Well, well, they were more diplomat diplomatic. They weren't royalty protection. So with a royalty protection, there would have been a vetting a deeper level of vetting gone on. Um, but um, with these other two, no, no, no. It, it, parliamentary and diplomatic, um, 
protection only. So, um, oh, so MPs. Anyway, it, it would have been, it would have been MPs and diplomats. So whenever you go, so they're different to royalty protection, right? Um, the royalty protection, quite an elite little unit, um, you know, and and there would have been a lot of background checks on these people. But with the politicians and the diplomatic lot, no, not so much. So, you know, they'd still be armed to the same degree. Uh, but this is when you you drive through central London, if you go past the Israeli embassy or, or special place of residence. You'll, you'll see these red police vans and red police cars. That, that's why they're red. They're, 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 they are the same command unit that um, that both cousins and, and this Carrick were, were in. So when we go in central London, you see the red ones. That is a parliamentary and diplomatic protection group. That's why they're red. Um, they're not uh, proactive officers. Well, I, don't, I mean, I, I, you know, I... I will besmirch them because it, they're, they're not my sort of people. Uh, but they, um, for me, that is not police. That's my opinion. That's not police. Anyway, John, you've blown the whistle. You've lived to tell the tale, uh, which is great. Uh, is there any way for people to follow your work, listeners? Well, well, I, I tend to keep keep it on the low now. I um, I had a lot that when YouTube uh, did a lot of their uh, sort of clean out, um, they they didn't allow the word satanic to be used in their videos and paedophile and nonce and all sorts of things so a lot of my videos were taken down under that um uh you know a little bit of policing that they did on youtube so there are i still got the the don wedger j-o-n w-e-d-g-e-r wedger um youtube you know i am on social media i'm on facebook um twitter tiktok i'm, I'm doing a campaign at the moment um it's called PSAD, P dash uh, S A D. It's called Pants Women Against Depression. And I've been going around through the coldest days uh, of the winter and I've been swimming in my pants in various open water UK locations, reservoir, rivers, the sea. Um, I've been filming it, uh, some of it live, some of it pre record. And it's all to highlight the benefits of um, cold water therapy. And, and also, um, it's an anti-depression, anti-suicide um, sort of stance that I'm taking. It really does work. Too many lives are lost through, through depression and suicide, and it doesn't need to be the way, you know. So a lot of victims and survivors, uh, especially this time of year, are suffering very, very badly. And, and I do it because I don't, I don't want to see people lose their lives through suicide. Well, that's brilliant, but, John. I mean, you. by the way, you just dropped in this whole thing of satanic abuse there. Uh, I mean, for someone who's actually been quite close to a lot of this stuff, uh, it's been poo-pooed by people at, uh, well, most of the London media, really, including Private Eye. They say this is nonsense. It doesn't exist. I if it does exist, what is it? Right, well, well, well Private Eye always seem to, um, Roslyn Waterhouse and our cohorts always seem to, turn up whenever um, anyone speaks about uh, satanic ritual abuse and try and denigrate them. Um, so it's, it's, it's the same old suspects. But, but it, you know, it's, it's deity worship, um, Luciferianism, Satanism. Um, they worship these deities. Part of the worship is blood sacrifice um, and child abuse. So, you know, their animals are, are killed and mutilated. Um, in the, these things I've spoken to um, many victims of it who have been gang raped um, made to take part in bestiality as young children they've also been made to, to kill um, young babies uh, women have abortions in these things, fetuses are, it, it's an absolutely appalling, abhorrent um, uh, you know ancient belief system it's also it's very clandestine you it does rise to the surface every now and then and make the news uh last week the uh, daily uh the daily star actually did an article and it's running an article all this week on on the reality of satanic ritual abuse it's incredibly damaging to anyone who survives it um and, and the victims suffer terribly and they suffer with a uh a thing called did which which is Disassociated identity disorder, multiple personalities, and that's where you can pretty much tell the difference between a survival of abuse, sexual childhood abuse, and ritualistic abuse because they will have this split personality. 
uh, and it, it, it's debilitating and it's very difficult for them to break free from it. Well, but it, is a, it sounds, it is sounds incredibly dark. I mean, how do you keep going through that sort of, uh, when, you're, when you're interviewing somebody who's been through that? Well, I, I mean, you know, it's not my pain, it's their pain. You know, um, my job was an interviewer and it was to elicit information. I think this thing needs exposing. You know, I, I, I believe... They believe in Satan. I believe in the winner, which is Jesus Christ. Um, he ultimately wins, and and it will get this will get exposed in his name. But um, you know, unfortunately, these poor people. You know, who do they listen to? Who do they turn to? You know, the system does not allow them to have a voice. And how can you have healing if you don't have justice? Um, this stuff does need exposing. Um, it does need bring to the surface. We need specially trained police officers to deal with this. Uh, there was there was a lady, I can't remember her name, but she was a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. She went on to become a barrister. She went on to educate the Metropolitan Police on the reality of satanic ritual abuse. She went on to, to do a forensic lesson on if they ever get called to a place of worship, such as a church or a graveyard, and certain items are found that they should consider satanic ritual abuse as a viable option. And there was a senior detective shut her down. Um, and this, this senior detective, his name has been mentioned to me a few times, has been involved in, in ritual abuse. Um, the, the Americans take it very seriously. Uh, there's a film um, called Deliver Us From Evil, in which Eric Banner plays a detective called Ralph Sarchi. Ralph Sarchi, um, I know Ralph Sarchi, he worked with a Catholic priest and they would go around investigating murders which had very sinister undertones and they were highly successful in, in highlighting ritual abuse and prosecuting it and the NYPD are, are, are decades ahead of us in this. You know, the South African police um, deal with it a lot, you know, even in Europe. It's just come out that Mark Dutroux, the Beast of Belgium, was involved in ritual abuse. And again, it, you know, Satanism is another secret society. So it's another will within a will. It's another reason to keep things quiet, you know. So it, it's a very, very dark, um, awful topic. But, you know, we, we can't just cover it over. We can't. It, all of it has to be exposed. And um, it, it only gets that way by people speaking up, standing up, and one thing that was said to me, Tony, many years ago, do you not get frightened? Well, yeah, of course, I nearly lost everything. I you know, I nearly went to prison. I nearly lost my home. And I nearly lost one of my children. Um, and my testimony is out there. But John Wedger testimony is out there exactly what I went through. Um, but my fear is inconsequential, is negligible to the fear of that poor child that's going through it right now that is hiding under that duvet as it's being pulled from over them. You know, that is the real fear. So I think we need to man up, we need to grow up, and we need to stand up and we need to speak up, you know. Well, look, um, I remember when the Savile thing happened afterwards, they said, well, the situation's changed, this could never happen again. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It clearly has been ca carrying on, and it sounds to me like the new Met Commissioner, Mark Rowley, has got quite a job on his hands, John. So well, well, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Well, 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 I'll leave you with this one. Don't, don't so much concentrate on who does it. Look at who allows it to be done. Now, keep our eye on Mark Rowley. If, he, if he's a man of integrity, which I think he is, he will, he will do something about this. Crested it, it never did. And our predecessor, Hogan Howe and all them, never did either. But this guy looks like he is. So, God willing, this, this will be exposed. And, you know, God bless all victims and survivors. Um, and keep speaking out. Don't give up. Uh, OK, when, when people are having their prayers at their church on a Sunday, you know, maybe a good idea to put one in for Mark and see if he can do his job properly. All right, thanks very much, John. God bless you, Tony. Thank you for giving me the platform.